Evil 2. Despite the series being older than I am, there's a love I have for the first few games that I simply can't shake. The games don't even scare me anymore, but something about trekking through these old halls brings me a sense of nostalgia I probably shouldn't even have. Resident Evil 2 and its remake are some serious heavy hitters in the gaming world. The first game might have brought survival horror to the masses, but it's safe to say it doesn't hold a candle to the firestorm that was Resident Evil 2's original release. It sold nearly 5 million copies, which is quite the feat for 1998. The remake, however, blows it clean out of the water with a whopping 5.8 million sales, and that's only including the one version to the original and its ports. To wrap up my rambling here, what I mean to say is that the game is legendary. Since Resident Evil 1's remake all the way back in 2002, fans have been begging for a reimagining of the sequel, and I think it's obvious Capcom delivered. The anticipation for this game was at a fever pitch when it was announced back in 2015, and when it finally released in 2019, well, the reaction was a bit mixed. Don't get me wrong, it was mostly positive. The gameplay was a fresh take on an old style, the level design was top notch and horrifying, and yet people did have their issues. It might be easy to brush this off as simple nitpicking, can't please everybody, right? I've said this before and I'll say it again, just because I like something does not mean it's free of criticism. As good as these two games are, I think it's only fair to bring down the magnifying glass and give them a deeper look in this episode of Topic Change. We'll start with the biggest change between the two iterations. This is something I glossed over incredibly briefly in my last episode, but the gameplay in the remakes compared to the originals is almost like night and day. What was once slow, anchor-like movement has transformed into complete third-person freedom. Now that I've gotten my hands on it, I can say this is some of the best gameplay Resident Evil has ever had. It takes the perfect step towards the modern era by releasing you from the iron grip of tank controls, but still keeping character speeds low enough that you don't zoom around like an action hero. The guns feel satisfying and are just powerful enough to feel like you're not defenseless in this cold, rainy zombie apocalypse. That being said, I still have a soft spot for the original. Tank controls aren't perfect by any means, but something about them instills that little spice of dread. Knowing you don't have full control can really amp up the pressure, though sometimes it can feel a little silly when all you want to do is turn around and the fastest way to do it is to make a wide turn like a delivery truck. Combat in these older titles is very interesting to me. Since there's not too much finesse available to you, most of the time it's about using your resources as cost effectively as possible. If you could slip past the guy, that's great! If not, you'll need to decide if a full kill is worth it or not. I feel like this game does have an issue of overabundance at times though. Zombies can take anywhere from 3 to 10 pistol bullets to put down, but I never really felt like I was hurting for ammo at any point in my most recent revisits. In a lot of early sections of the game, I hardly ever dipped below 80 extra bullets, and sometimes I was coasting around 120 or more. It felt weird, but it might be a symptom of game knowledge. Finding yourself low on gear is something you experience less often as you play more. A first playthrough might see you sputtering to the finish with a single round in the chamber, but once you learn enemy layouts and proper movement with the tank controls, you'll probably end up wasting bullets for fun near the end. There's also a ton of hidden items in this game that I was surprised to find. I've known about a couple of these tucked away spots for so long that they've been burned into my memory, like this freebie in the liquor hallway, but I never knew there was a box of ammo behind this stupid statue. Who would think to click the interact button here? On the flip side, I think the remake does a really good job of keeping the feeling of hopelessness intact. Ammo shortages feel a bit more frequent, and that might partly be thanks to the gunpowder system. This was something they introduced in the original Resident Evil 3, and it makes its first reappearance right here in the dank halls of the police station. Combining certain powders rewards different types of ammo, and repeat creation of the same ammo type will net a bigger payout. It's a small thing, but it turns a potential problem in an overabundance of a single ammo type into the freedom to choose the type of ammo you want for the type of gun you fancy most. The remake also changes how you deal with enemy attacks by reintroducing the subweapon system. While in the 1998 version you could simply mash your way out of a grab, the remake opted for something a little more engaging. Originally a mechanic introduced in Resident Evil 1's remake, the sub-weapon system is a small list of accessories that can be used to ward off grasping foes. Knives or grenades can be kept on your person, and if you get grabbed by a ghoulie you can spend one of them to free yourself from the foe's grasp. It's a neat little mechanic, and I think a worthwhile inclusion to the game. Not only does it give you yet another resource to be mindful of, it turns the mostly ignored knife into a vital asset, and allows for some pretty unique uses of grenades if you're unsure of your aim.
Raccoon City is host to a cavalcade of night terrors. Be it shambling corpses or rotting canines, these hollowed halls are filled to bursting with mutants of all shapes and sizes. Zombies in RE2 are interesting. In the original, they almost serve as an obstacle more than a true enemy. Weave through them or blast away and you'll be rewarded with a clean bill of health, but get too relaxed and they'll chow through a few inches of your shoulder and leave you limping. In rooms where they only toss one or two enemies your way, I always felt it was a test of your awareness. It's probably easier to just remove them, but if you can grab what you need and bolt before they shamble too close, you'll be saving a decent chunk of resources. I think zombies are best used when a room litters them around rather than clump them up. Clustered hallways like these are the best example. They force you to think on your feet in the best way. Am I dexterous enough to weave through? Do I even have enough room to slip by? Maybe wasting ammo here is a better idea. Everyone's experience will vary wildly, and I think that's one of the best parts of these early titles. Other examples, like this room here, serve more as stopgaps to check your ammo or skill level. Less a moment to think, and more a moment to feel cool as you mow down a dozen or so groaning beasts. Unless, of course, you're an extreme hoarder and decide to just wing it. The remake, however, shifts the focus of zombies quite a bit, giving them a much more active role. One of the biggest changes is their ability to follow you through rooms, meaning certain areas you thought were completely safe could become new hotspots if you're not careful. Their durability seems to vary much more wildly than it did in the original. Some zombies can go down in as little as 3 or 4 hits, but I've seen others swallow upwards of 20 shots. The emphasis here is placed pretty intensely on either incapacitating or flat out running away from most of these guys. It's not impossible to kill every undead, but it's certainly not recommended. Even with their increased variety though, they're not too scary, but you've also got some of your own movement upgrades. Dodging is about on par with the original in terms of difficulty, at least in my opinion. So sure, zombies are great and all, but what about the rest of the cast? Truth be told, I've never really been a fan of the animal enemies. Dogs and crows always felt so static. Either you knock them down or you take a tiny little bit of damage. Crows are a worse offender here, I think. The only rooms they show up in are usually small enough that you can get to your destination before they even start flying around. A lot of people were upset that they were removed from the remake, and honestly, I can't say I'm too surprised. Dogs, on the other hand, can serve some small challenge on occasion. They don't do too much damage in either game, but as long as you find some way to funnel them towards you, then they're a little more than an ammo sponge. Lickers and Ivies are the heavy hitters this time around, and they can range from intense challenge to snorefests. It's astonishing how something as simple as a room's layout can quickly invalidate these guys. In a lot of early encounters, lickers are really easy to slip past. They will never attack unless you make enough noise, so in most instances, they can just be ignored. Hell, the first licker you see is supposed to be this intimidating moment, and in both games you can pretty easily just scoot away without issue. Once you get to the lab, though, they introduce the evolved lickers. These guys can actually be a decent threat, since they're usually used as jump scares. Since they're attacking right away, the game won't let you slip by unnoticed. Ivies are pretty basic, all things considered. They're one of only two enemies that can poison you in the original game, but they can only inflict poison if you decide to weaken them in the A scenario by switching on the anti-BOW gas. In the remake, however, they do feel a little more engaging. They've been given an entirely new design, and their only attack can instantly kill you if you don't have a sub-weapon on hand. No! Their health pools are massive unless you hit their weak points, and they can only be fully killed with a fire weapon. It gives them a unique flair that enhances the challenge of the end portion of the game in a very positive way. I also want to take a very small moment to mention briefly the forgotten enemy. In the original, huge spiders roam the sewers. These massive eight-legged freaks could climb the walls and ceiling, dropping poison on your head as you trudge through the water. A lot of people were incredibly upset that they were removed, but personally I'm glad they kicked a bucket. Their replacement, the G-Adult, is a much more grotesque and unique design. Originally it was used for a boss fight. Littering a bunch of these monstrosities throughout the sewer portion made it feel a bit more harrowing than before. It feels like another positive change. Sorry spider fans, but the gross lizards are here to stay. Our first boss type enemy is the trench coat wearing tyrant, nicknamed Mr. X. His usage between the two iterations is wildly different, yet served the same basic purpose. The tyrant's only goal seems to be to kill any survivors who could spill the beans about Umbrella. He's sturdy, ruthless, and quite a fashionable gent. In the original, he only ever appeared in the B scenario of either character. He was almost a hidden enemy, referenced very little if at all by the game's marketing, and not a peep from the manual, which simply states the second scenario is worth a try. If you've got the guts. 
I would say his use in the original is decent. The tyrant likes to show up quite a bit, but only ever when you make progress in the puzzle solving department. Pick up an integral item? Tyrant. Meet up with another character in the RPD? Tyrant. Check a camera? Tyrant. It felt like he was less of a stalker and more of a hunter? Maybe an opportunist? He only ever popped up to slow you down when it was least useful for you. Usually his encounters are placed in tight hallways or claustrophobic rooms, meaning if you don't know how to tango with him, you'll either waste some ammo or break a rib. All that being said, he isn't too painful to deal with in the long run. He's durable, sure, but when you down him, he usually rewards you with a decent chunk of ammunition, which on occasion gave me more ammo than I actually wasted. I also felt his design was a little stumpy looking. I think it was to make sure he fit in every environment he could potentially show up in, but it makes him look kind of goofy sometimes. That being said, the animation of him slowly rising after you leave a room that you've downed him in always looked super cool to me. In the remake, he was obviously given a much more active role, both in-game and in the marketing for the remake itself. He's this huge, intimidating monster, hell-bent on taking either character down from about the quarter way point of the story. His inclusion here is a lot more vicious. Jesus. Jesus Christ! During the early portions, he stalks you constantly, meaning that once he arrives, you need to route your run through each room incredibly precisely, or you'll risk wasting tons of time and possibly health when he corners you somewhere you really didn't want him to show up. Lose sight of him long enough though, and you can actually hear him when he's in nearby rooms. I was surprised at how fair the game treated him most of the time. He doesn't just jump around the map if you can't see him, he has to actively track you down. If he doesn't have any sound cues from running or gunfire, it can go upwards of 20 minutes before he gets close to your location, which I think is pretty neat. If you do decide to stand your ground and fire off a few rounds, you'll find he's definitely a tad more durable than his shorter brother. Downing him now is linked to a timer rather than when you leave the room, and reaps no resource reward whatsoever. I suppose it makes sense that the monster hunting you wouldn't be hoarding ammo for the guns he doesn't even have, but it does desensitize combat with him majorly. Whether or not that's a bad thing is up to you. Being a horror game and all, I feel like it kind of makes sense for him to be a detriment. Removing rewards and upping his intrusion time makes him a lot scarier, but I could easily see if someone felt some small bit of frustration when they decided to man up and drop the tyrant to his knees. Downing such a huge threat only to be met with a thumbs down by the game is kind of frustrating. He also has a boss form, but it's exclusive to Leon's story in the remake. I think both designs look cool and tie back to RE1 nicely. As flashy as the remix version is though, something about the simple design of the 1998 version is kind of cool. It looks like what a more mutated tyrant would have reasonably eventually become. Also, his original boss fight gives us these. Game over. You lose, big guy. William Birkin is one of the only other bosses found throughout Resident Evil 2, with his main gimmick being his ever-changing mutations. He starts simple, as a malformed humanoid, but as he is damaged and the virus is forced to change him, his design becomes more grotesque and vicious. I've always loved the design of Birkin. He's got an excellent and striking look, and his boss theme becoming more grandiose with each subsequent encounter was always a really cool idea to me. In the original, you don't actually encounter him for a decent while. His first form isn't even seen in full during the first scenario, being seen only by the second character who promptly knocks him around. When you do come face to face with him, you're met with a decent challenge. Birkin's second form isn't anything to scoff at. He's a little slow, sure, but he can put some serious damage in if you don't pace the fight properly. What I like most about Birkin is something that the remake does very poorly. It feels like they made full use of the dual scenario system for this antagonist. You don't get to see the full extent of his journey unless you play both characters. It always seemed more compelling that way, at least in my opinion. He's usually in the middle of mutating when you run into him, which I always found cool. It made me feel that little bit more engaged with the game world. In the remake, however, every form of Birkin is used for both scenarios. Call me silly if you want, but this was a horrible decision. It ruined the timeline of events in a major way, but we'll talk about that in just a little bit. The more important failing for now is the fight itself. The mechanics behind fighting Birkin were in some serious need of playtesting. I mean, in what world does it make sense that beating Birkin's first form is infinitely faster with the knife? This is not a small thing either. It's not, oh, if you glitch the game, the knife will take him down. I'm not talking about the PC version where you can have 200 FPS and kill Birkin in two hits. I'm talking about the PS4 version where the knife isn't broken. It's just its normal self and somehow you can cut clean through him before you can swing once. On the flip side, fighting him regularly is about as fun as cleaning up dried paint with a rotting broom. 
He takes way, way, way too many bullets to take down for how his fight is designed. He is constantly tailing behind you, so if you stop too long to shoot, you get hit. But if you don't stop enough, he'll lose sight of you and jump away, which just wastes your time. This is some serious, atrocious game design. It's not scary, it's not fun, it's not anything, it's just bad. I feel like this is crazy talk. I hate that he dies too fast, but I hate that he doesn't die fast enough either. It astonishes me that they got it so wrong. The originals aren't paragons of game design in this department, but the first form of Birkin is, if you look at it objectively, functionally identical. They both take place in a cramped arena, they both lumber after you, and they both have attacks that focus on using their mutated hand rather than a normal one. The difference here is that Birkin's first form in the original was given far less health, and felt more like an introduction to the monster. The boss arena is also a bit more cramped, and he isn't nearly as fast either. In the remake, I can't help but feel that someone forgot to tune the numbers properly and left them in a very weird position. To be fair though, his other forms are treated a bit more fairly, thankfully. G2 is given a gimmick with the crane, and G3 is basically the same as before, only the arena is altered a fair amount. Rather than waiting for the elevator ride or riding down to lift, you're dueling in what looks like to be some sort of generator or reactor room. It gives the fight a very volatile and dangerous feel, like if you don't finish this fast enough, he might blow something up. I can't say I'm much of a fan of Claire's final boss, G4. He's fine in the original, being portrayed as this wild animal as the mutation starts to go crazy to keep the host alive. He jumps around the arena a bunch, and since he's so much faster than you, it can get a little annoying. I usually have to waste at least a health item or two to get by, but that's me. The remake is basically the same, only the arena is much tighter, and you can climb the walls, which presents some kind of cool opportunities to stun him if you have the right gear. I do feel like he's a little overtuned, but it gets a pass because it's the final boss. Sure, there's G5, but he's basically just an ammo sink for the second run. He's not really a fight so much as he is an interactive cutscene. One of the most important things for a horror game is the why. Why is there a zombie outbreak? Why is Chris not here at the police station? Who blew up this wall? Why is this police station so confusing? Sometimes the questions are answered, and other times it'd be better if they just stayed mysteries. I'll preface this section by admitting that the stories in Resident Evil have never been amazing. They're fun and engaging, but look hard enough and you can poke holes pretty easily. Even still, I love them with all my heart. What I want to focus on most is the great effort put into keeping the original story and its timeline consistent. I have a lot of issues with the remake's retelling of events, but the list is far too large for this video. One of the biggest changes between Resident Evil 2 and the original game from 1996 was its inclusion of an interconnected story for its protagonists. Chris and Jill's journey was simply hand waved away, explaining that the character you didn't play as got captured, but this time the team opted for a different approach for the sequel. Both characters went through the nightmare simultaneously, running into one another at various points to provide additional information or simply emotional support. Even those interactions varied a fair amount depending on who you played first. It was a pretty important thing, and it changed the plot up quite a bit for each playthrough. It has caused some small issues with canon in the later games, however, but it's presumed some mixture of all four scenarios is the true story. For instance, in Claire A's campaign, Sherry gets infected with the G-Virus, which is canonized in later games, but it's also canon that Claire faces off against Birkin's first form, which can only happen if you play her second. The remake does away with any campaign issues by squishing the story a fair bit. Character choice won't affect either story whatsoever, save for where the player starts after the introductory cutscene. It's a little staggering just how insular the two campaigns are. Neither protagonist runs into the other very often, meeting only once at the gas station, reuniting with an iron fence between them, and then suddenly both being at the lab for the final moment. They gave the duo at least a little teamwork the first time around. Leon and Claire were able to update one another at key moments thanks to them both having radios to keep in touch. If you accomplished a major goal, the other character would know. It would help inform the next stage of their escape plan. A mechanic that was advertised a lot in the original release was the zapping system. Due to the full story being cut into two scenarios, you could influence certain events during your first playthrough that would affect the next. Close off these windows? It might help you out in the here and now, but later, the machine short circuits and your second character has to deal with the mess. Did you put the zombified Marvin to rest in his office? Now your partner never has to tango with him. There's a ton of these little events all over the game. Certain items will only appear if the first run left them behind or unlocked the pathway. Some enemies would be stronger or weaker depending on your actions. It'd be one thing if this idea was left the same as before, but it's been stripped clean for the remake. Nothing you do can ever affect your partner. Ever. How cool would it have been to see a more advanced zapping system? Maybe the two heroes run into one another more often, sharing gear or helping one another with puzzles in cool ways. If they wanted to get devilish, they could have capped all ammo across the playthrough. Pick up every bullet you find as Leon? Looks like Claire's going to be doing a budget run this time around. It would be a really cool way to force strategy. 
do I really need this herb right now? Or will Leon be in a tight spot by the time I play as him? A really interesting idea that maybe not everyone would have liked would have been to add some sort of co-op mode. Think something like Resident Evil Outbreak. Each of you would be able to explore the station at your own pace. You would trade keys and other items as you run into one another. I can see a few major issues with this though, one being that not everyone wants to play this kind of game with a friend, and the other being that if there's a skill gap, sometimes your run will suddenly end because 16 rooms away your buddy got swarmed all because they checked their phone. It's not a perfect idea, but anything would have been better than the honestly unfinished version they gave us. You can almost tell the second run feature wasn't originally planned. It's almost an afterthought, which it would have been fine to disclude, but how late into development did they toss it back in? It's barely a remix mode. Aside from that though, the story isn't too bad. I have my problems with it, and they are numerous, but it's also really cool to see a classic story given a fresh coat of paint. One notch of praise I really have to give is I think the actors did a fantastic job portraying these iconic characters. That being said, I always feel a little odd when I hear Leon or Claire curse. Resident Evil always had a campy horror vibe to me. It's supposed to be scary, but it's 90s horror. You can't curse in 90s horror, okay? That's bullshit. <laughs> They're probably going for a more realistic interpretation, which makes sense. If you were in the situation, I'm sure your mouth would dirty quite a bit before you escaped. With our rather wordy analysis complete, what's the final result? When I originally wrote the script, I had a lot of mixed feelings, and ended up giving the gold star to the remake. But having let the script simmer in my brain for a bit, I think the original is an easy winner here. Had the plot been a bit less muddy in the remake, or some of the boss mechanics a tad more streamlined, I might have given the remake the win still. But the OG is one of my favorite games ever made. In my mind, this is some of the best the series has ever been. Fantastic level design, engaging story, and a great soundtrack I didn't even dedicate a section to. So yeah, RE2 wins. It's up to us to take out Umbrella. But like I said before, this is comparing two giants to one another. RE2 is a 10 out of 10 in my mind, but that just means RE2 Remake is a slightly worse 10 out of 10. Don't listen to him, he's full of shit. How sad. Claire, you made it! Yeah... Have you seen a Resident Evil video around here? Yeah, you just missed it. Who made it? I don't know. But it's too dangerous for the viewer to watch the rest of the series without seeing this part. Leon, I'll go look for a replay button. You go and find us a way out of here. Of course. But before I forget, here's a subscription button. That way, we can be alerted when the next part is uploaded.